we are in Genesis, so please turn there. Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verses 14 right through to the end of Genesis chapter 3. And I've got the audacious task of working through this whole text, so um, follow along. Let us have a look. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for, uh, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made, of, made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. That is the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Lord, we do praise your name and thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together to be able to sing your praises, to be able to petition our God with regards to the things of this church and the things of your kingdom. And Lord, thank you for the blessing it is to have the special revelation of the revealed word of God. Lord, that word that is a sword, Lord, I pray that by it you would reprove us. Lord, that you would correct us and instruct us, train us, Lord, teach us and build us up in our most holy faith. Strengthen us and guide us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, You probably know of a man named Dr. James Dobson. He was the founder of Focus on the Family and uh, story goes that he was traveling through Southern California and he saw this sign and it read, Absolutely no trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Signed, the Sisters of Mercy. You got the joke? (laughs) The sign is sort of reflective of how we wrestle with God's justice and God's mercy. And quite often we fall onto one side of the path or the other and quite often reflect God with regards to a just God or a merciful God. We know that he is infinitely wise and he perfectly deals out justice. And at the same time, he is a merciful God who does not give as our sins deserve. Therefore, for the Christian, we can truly say that um, behind or Surrounding that cloud of judgment is always a silver lining. We truly are doing better than we deserve. God is holy, he's righteous, he is just, and yet at the same time, he is loving and he is merciful. And in Genesis 3, we see how God deals with trespassers of his law. He does not come and say, hey, listen, Adam and Eve, Sorry, it didn't work out that well. All's forgotten and all's forgiven. Come, let's relax and let's enjoy the fruits of these trees. Doesn't say that, does he? Does it? Nor does he come with vengeance to smote them dead on the spot. 
but rather he comes and he mediates justice while at the same time bringing grace and mercy to them and to us. In Genesis 3, we see the beginning of a scarlet thread that begins here because sin has come and will thread its way right throughout the Old Testament and finally find its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ who died upon the cross for our sins. The main lesson I want to give you that is in your notes this morning is that God brings just punishment for our sin, affecting all areas of our life while ultimately granting us God's covering grace through Christ, justice and mercy. And it sort of answers the question, why is the world like it is? Why are we in this mess? Well, we will find out why that is here in this passage. But before I want to, before I deal with this, I do need to deal with, I believe, a question that certainly comes to my mind and I think comes to many people's minds as they look at this. And that is, did Adam and Eve's sin thwart God's plans? Did Adam and Eve's sin thwart God's plans or was sin part of God's original plan? In the context of our passage this morning, we are presented with what is called the Proto-Evangelium. Proto-Evangelium, proto meaning first, and Evangelium or Evangelium meaning good news. We see here in verse 15, the first gospel that says, he, that is the seed of the offspring, sorry, the offspring of Eve shall bruise the head of the of Satan, at, who will at the same time bruise his heel. Now, God, what we see here is God always had a plan in mind, and that plan came to at least be revealed to us when sin came. We see this in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Peter states to those in Jerusalem as he's preaching, he says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God's prophecy of Jesus coming to crush the serpent was part of his eternal plan. We must understand that God displayed his undiminished sovereignty, firstly, when he created the world. Spoken, it came into existence. He, created, he um, showed his unreserved sovereignty when he created man and gave them dominion over the world. Nothing changed. He remained sovereign and he shows his sovereignty even in the midst of sin. No, it wasn't that God had a plan A and that somehow Adam and Eve thwarted that plan and therefore he had to create a plan B. Like in heaven, he had to say, oh man, this has all gone a bit awry. I didn't expect this. Therefore, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we've got a number of choices here. We can go down, we can kill these guys, and we can start again. Plan A is done. He doesn't say that. Nor, does it, nor is it like, hey, now Jesus, listen, um, you're going to have to go down and be sacrificed to get plan B in operation. No, hard, as hard as it is for us to understand, sin coming into the world was part of God's ordained plan. God, only, God only, not only knew that man would sin, but ordained it to occur without any wickedness on God's part. Sin is lawlessness, but God is not lawless. Sin was the instinct or the desire of man in his thoughts, words, and actions, and all blame is laid at the foot of man, and yet it did not in any way go contrary to God's plans. In fact, it fulfilled it. We might say that sin is a decreed intruder that opens our eyes to see Christ. Sin is a decreed intruder that opens our eyes to see Christ. We would not know of God's grace, of God's mercy, of his love, of his patience without sin. We would not know of Christ without sin. 
And so no, sin was part of God's ordained plan and in no way does it diminish his perfection, sin's abhorrence, God's divine justice against it and our redemption from it or our need of redemption from it. So God is still sovereign. God is still in control. He is not second guessing. He is not acting out of impulse now of what um, man destroyed. God was sovereign. He is sovereign and he will always be sovereign. And your sin and my sin stand under the sovereignty of God, though we do it willingly. First point, grace admits the curse of the serpent. Grace admits the curse of the serpent. Sin does bring divine consequences. There's no getting around that. Uh, Whether it is directly as divine judgment, we know this in Um, Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira lied and what happened to them, they were struck down dead on the spot. That was immediate divine justice. But also brings natural, in a sense, justice that God has built into the system of creation. And that is, men, if you had an argument or you did not treat your wife well this morning, as you ought to love her as Christ loves the church, you are probably uh, disunified from her right now. That is divine justice in one sense. He set it up so that obedience, a life in Christ, brings, fulfills righteous living. Disobedience to God brings justice, whether it's divine justice immediately or whether it's natural as God has built in. The point being, no one can sin and get away with it. No one can sin and get away with it. Believer might be forgiven, but there are consequences for our sin. As Paul says, the wages of sin is really death. It is. And so Adam and Eve sinned grievously by disobeying the Lord's command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And last week, we saw the response to this. We know they sewed fig leaves together to hide their shame. They hid from God. They heard God coming. They hid from God. God calls out in a um, in a in a, a word to try and arouse their confession and says, "Where are you?" Comes for the sinner. God tries to extract a true confession out of them. They then devoid though they uh, they they deflect blame to each other, and then the serpent. And what we noted last week, that true confession brings true restoration with God and others. God questioned Adam, who blamed Eve. God questioned Eve, who blamed Adam. But God doesn't question, sorry, God questioned Eve, who blamed the serpent. Now, God doesn't question the serpent here. He just simply condemns him. The serpent cannot be redeemed. The serpent cannot learn anything from God. The serpent just simply lays under God's justice. There is no grace for the serpent, only for humans. Therefore, he says here in verse 14, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now, um, we look at this and think that maybe this tells the story of how the lizard or how the, how the lizard lost its legs to become a snake, you know, because it now has to eat dust. Maybe we can think like that. I think, I think the main point being is that animals were meant to be under the authority and dominion of humans because the serpent stood up to take the role and responsibility of the authority over man, therefore, for a perpetual picture of the divine curse, the snake would eat dust all its life. And even in Isaiah, it does say that even the, um, the, in the new heavens and new earth, that snake will continue to eat dust. There is no redemption in a sense. And that is a picture of the curse on snakes. And I will just simply say, I don't know why anyone would keep a pet snake. (laughs) They are a grotesque creature, but maybe you think they're just absolutely beautiful. I don't know why you would do that. But we do at the same time, honor and uphold animals above humans, don't we? We cry at the abuse of the chicken while turning a blind eye to the abuse of a child. There is a distortion to the created order. 
And how fitting it is that this snake who exalted himself is now, or snakes, is now biting the dust. That was the curse to the animal. But then it talks about now the person behind or the one behind the animal, and that is Satan. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. War is a terrible thing. But when war is a divine call, then it is a good thing. What we see here is that God, by his grace, puts enmity between who? Between Eve, the woman, and the serpent, and Satan. Previously, Eve had succumbed to the lie of Satan and under the authority of Satan. And so God, by his grace now, brings protection to her own soul by creating a perpetual war between the woman and the serpent. That there would be a barrier between her and her enemy, but not only her and her enemy, because notice this, it is between her offspring and his offspring. What does this mean? What does this mean? Well, we, we notice that in uh, Genesis 4 that Eve does have offspring, doesn't she? She has two. She has Cain and she has Abel. And you might say, well, there, that's the offspring of Eve. They are the ones who will then uh, have enmity against, the, uh, against Satan or the serpent. Not so fast. In 1 John 3.12, it says this, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And, they did, uh, and why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. What John is saying here, that in the biological seed of the woman, there are two seeds in operation here, two offspring. There is the offspring of Satan in Cain, who killed the righteous offspring of Eve in Abel. You see this presented right there. And then uh, Jesus says to the Pharisees in uh, John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do the father's desires. He's saying that you oppose God. Therefore, if you oppose God, you are offspring of Satan. But what about you and I? Well, who, whose offspring are we? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, Ephesians 2, 1 to 2 speaks of the church from a redeemed state, but speaks of what they were. And he said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. I know this might not sound very embracing, but all who oppose Christ, and that was all of us at one stage, are or were the offspring of Satan. All who are in Christ are now the offspring of Eve, the righteous offspring. And God has said it so that there is enmity between the two. The offspring of Eve, of Christ, the offspring of Satan. No wonder then, um, John goes on to say in the next verse, in 1 John 3.13, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Why? Because you are in a war since Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God, by his grace, has not allowed you to capitulate, but has allowed you and called you to stand firm in this war. We cannot be ambivalent to it. And it should not take us by surprise. This is part of the curse of Satan, and it's a grace upon the godly seed. There is enmity between us. Therefore, we shouldn't be surprised when we are attacked. But how do we have the ability to fight this war? Well, this comes now to the seed, the true fulfillment of the seed of Eve. And that is verse 15. He, singular, shall bruise your head 
Satan, or we could say crush your head and you, Satan, shall bruise his heel. While the Lord has been talking about the offspring generally of Eve and Satan, now he's referring to a unique person, the one who will be an ultimate threat to Satan. There'll be one man who will crush Satan and destroy him from forever. And he will come through the bowels of Eve from generation to generation to generation and wage mortal combat against Satan and win. And we see this in the apostle Peter when he picks this up because remember the godly line, and we're going to be following the godly line through um, Genesis, comes to Abraham and then Abraham is given a promise. And Paul picks this up in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, rather re referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. So I want to be very clear, when we are looking at Genesis 3.15, right there we have the first gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ coming to crush the head of the serpent. How is he going to do this? Well, we know that Jesus crushed the head of the serpent upon the cross. And, we, and uh, Ernest read this in the Colossians passage. Back in Genesis 3, early in Genesis 3, well, Genesis 2, actually, uh, man was put as the authority over all the animals, over all the earth. He was to hold the scepter of power. When he yielded to Satan, he gave that scepter of power to Satan. Satan took up that authority. Therefore, all who are outside of Christ are under the power or persuasion or authority of Satan. Christ comes crushes Satan by taking away our sin and by removing the power that we, um, by removing Satan's power that we ha do not have that yields to Satan. He removes that and gives us a power and in a sense, he takes as the second Adam the authority that the first Adam capitulated. No wonder in Genesis 28 Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Did Jesus have that authority as a man before his death? No. When Jesus was in the wilderness, being tempted by Satan, and, and Satan said, look at all the nations, look at all the dominion, I will give it to you. How could he give something that he did not have? He had it. Jesus died as a man, as our second Adam, and took the very scepter that Adam gave to Satan. He takes it up and says, now listen, I put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan, and I've now taken up back that authority, and I want you to go into this world and storm the gates of hell because the authority that I have is now with you. Go and give the gospel out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. He's waging war. And the church is called to wage war against Satan in the sense of not fighting Satan directly by preaching the gospel, by overthrowing man's souls of which Satan holds by preaching the gospel to release them from that. No wonder Paul says in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. No, you don't start wielding your sword at Satan directly. You just preach the gospel and God does the work through the gospel and his spirit. That's what he does. Do you struggle with sin? Do you struggle with sin? I won't let you raise your hands. But sometimes if we struggle with sin, we think if I'm struggling, something's wrong with my Christian life. Oh, how wrong that is. Friends, if you struggle with sin, you know you are in a war against the devil and against his powers. The Christian struggles with sin, the non-Christian doesn't. It is Christ, well, <laughs> it is right to struggle with sin. It is right to stand up against us and our greatest against it. Our greatest danger is not that we struggle with sin. It's that we get easy with sin. And we cease to struggle with it. We get comfortable with sin. 
and then we have actually removed ourselves from the fight that we're called to do. No, it is a fight that we are called to enter in. No wonder John Owen says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. It is one or the other. You don't have a choice and you will struggle with sin until you are glorified. But realize this, that Christ has the authority over it and the power to wield so that you don't have to be tempted and fall or don't have to fall into temptation. Satan wants you to think I've lost. I'm useless. I'm not how I should be. Yes, get in that position and then repent and cry out to Jesus and come back to him. That shows the real nature of a Christian. It's not that you just think you're perfect and you're just going through life as if everything's good. That's probably a person who's deluded in their Christian faith. Are you fighting sin? We've got to be fighting sin. Do we understand the severity of it? Have you grasped the serious consequences of your sin? Have you prayed for forgiveness and deliverance? Are you avoiding occasions that incite your sin? Are you yielding yourself to God's word? Are you seeking God's glory above all else? Who would have thought that in the curse toward Satan is actually grace of divine enmity towards him that we take up? That Christ has given us the power to wage war against. And you wage war in your mind as you yield yourself to the word of God. You wage war as you stand up against temptation and say, no, I'm not doing that. I trust in my God who will enable me to get through this and bless me. That's what I trust in. And you are waging war in that. The pure church wages war. Next thing. Grace admits the judgment of the woman. You will see that there is not a curse to the woman, but there are two judgments. One to her children or one to her childbearing and one to her marriage. Notice this. Verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Now, in the Hebrew, it literally states um, that he will surely, I'll surely multiply your painful toil in conception from the moment of conception. In painful toil, you shall bring forth children. Now, to those who have had children, those women, you know the pain and the toil that goes with having them. Morning sickness that changes your body. The pain of actually giving birth to children, but then there is a toil in pain as you bear the burdens of your children throughout all your mother and until you die. And this is a curse in a sense. It's bound up in the curse. So out of the children, there will be a godly offspring, but that godly offspring will come with pain. And mothers are created to nurture and love and, and they will feel the pain more than men do. This was part of the curse or part of the, the judgment upon women. And you are feeling that women as you bear children. But secondly, it says your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, I want you to notice that in the ESV, I'm not sure what version you're using, it says contrary. That word contrary is not there in the original. It's just simply, and the NIV picks this up, your desire will be to your husband and he shall rule over you. So what is it? Is it contrary? Is it to? Um, This NIV translation would give the idea that, well, I mean, we're getting back to Genesis 2 where you will have a good desire for your husband and he hopefully will have a godly rule over you. That'd be like the Song of Solomon's loving your husband. But I don't think that's what it is. I think uh, ESV have it correctly by putting the contrary in there. And if you are in Genesis, just flip over to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, and you'll see the same um, expression used to Cain. Cain was warned in verse 7 that sin is crouching like a lion at his door, And sin's desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Same word. It's put in there. So he's saying that sin's desire is not a good thing for you. It's contrary to you and you have to not yield to your desires, but stand against them because they want to take hold of you. Therefore, if we put that same idea back into Genesis here, 
um, in the verse, it'll be that your desire, women, not only Eve, is to rule your husband. And your husband's desire is to rule you. And this is not a good rule. It is not that you now desire to love him, to help him, to nurture him, to honor him and encourage him. Nor, men, is it that you desire, your innate desire now as part of the curse, it's not that you will just simply love and protect and guide and nurture and cherish and sanctify and lay your life down for your wife. No. Part of the sinful nature upon both man and upon women is that we want to usurp the other and not in a good way. And men, you will do this by the sheer nature of your brutish strength. Men are by nature stronger than women and we see this and that we will seek to dominate our wives with our loud voice, our anger and our strength. And we see this and we rightly have a disdain for that sort of rule. But that is the nature of man, if just left to his own devices. And yet, how do women try and rule men? Or oh, they'll rule them with their coercive behavior, by their words, by luring men to themselves, we see this in Proverbs chapter 7, that, that the seductive woman takes the man like, a, um, like an animal going to the slaughter, drinks of immorality, wipes her mouth and says, there's nothing wrong with that. John Piper makes the point saying, what's the greatest marketing tool that women use today or that the world uses? Is it not the female body? that the female body is marketed to bring men with their lust in subjection to women. If you can do that, you've got us. And yet in some crude way, we look at men's rulership with that brutish strength as wrong and it absolutely is and it's a disdain and yet we see the the coerciveness of women in this culture is somewhat wrongly glorified. God has set forth a plan here, fortunately in Christ, to redeem this. Because this is the nature and this is where you see the war in our culture, men against women, and it's wrong. It's not right. And we don't want that in the church. And so Christ comes to redeem us that we would not be led by those sinful desires that are contrary to Jesus. And the men would take Christ and then take up that godly leadership role to yield their life for the betterment of women, to love them, to cherish them, to guard and protect them as Adam should have. And women would not use their coercive behavior of words of nagging or even their looks to try and rule over men, but they would adorn themselves with the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Oh, there's a curse upon men and women here that will destroy society, but Christ has redeemed it. That we can have marriages that reflect the marriage of Christ and his church. Grace admits the judgment to the woman. Grace next admits the judgment to Adam. So there is Adam now. He has seen what's occurred to the serpent. You shall be judged and you shall eat dust and you're going to ultimately be destroyed. He's seen the judgment upon Eve that, that she will bear children in pain, that she will seek to rule over her husband. And now Adam is standing there, probably shaking in his boots, thinking, I'm gone. I'm the one who should have stood up against the serpent and here I am and God turns to him and probably looks him in the face, points his finger at him and says, cursed be to the ground. Hang on, let's try that again. Why the ground? Why not Adam? Adam, you did wrong. You did it. Why the ground? Why a diversion of judgment upon the ground and not against Adam? 
Well, isn't this setting up the very fact that God diverts judgment from sinful people because he's a God of grace? You see that right throughout the Old Testament to Abraham. He said, I want to take your your son, your only son, the one that you love. I want to take him up to Mount Moriah and I want you to take him as a sacrifice to me. And there is Abraham standing above Isaac and he's just about to plunge the knife in him. And the Lord God says, stop. Judgment needs to be done, but it's not going to be Isaac. It's going to be the ram that's left in the thicket. And then throughout the whole Old Testament, through the, through the Levitical system, that you see judgment continually diverted from the sinful man to animals. Through sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, until there is one spotless lamb without blemish who can take upon himself the sins of his people, who walks that road up Calvary, who is pinned to a cross, who is the one that should not receive judgment, but the judgment should have fallen on Adam and all of us. And there is the Christ who looks upon sinful man, scorning him, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What's Jesus saying? Divert the judgment one last time. Don't smote them, smote me for their crimes. Kill me and not them. And then no wonder Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Christ right then, once and for all, it is finished, bore our sin and pain. And there Adam is and he says, curse the ground, which is a diverted curse or a diverted judgment that would find its fulfillment in Christ. And everyone who comes under that blood of Christ, that judgment is diverted on Christ. You must come under the shadows of his wings if, your ju- if the judgment is going to be diverted from you. And it was placed upon the ground Adam had eaten eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had not eaten from all the trees to satisfy himself. Therefore, the very nature of sustaining his life through eating would be cursed. It says in verse 17, In pain you shall eat all the days of your life. Verse 23, Thorns and thistles will make eating challenging. And then in verse 19, it says, or so verse 18 first, and then verse 19, it says the same. All his eating, all his process of living will ultimately be a challenge. And then what's he gonna, what's gonna happen? There is a kind of grace because this will end, because you will die from dust you are taken, and from dust you will become, and that dust is the very food of the serpent. Remember, serpents will eat the dust, and then the man becomes serpent's food. But even, see, in Christ, he did not just take upon himself our sins and take us to a point of having a relationship with God. We still die. We are still going to be in the dust. In a certain number of years, none of us will be here. But we will be in the ground. But we have this assurance that in Christ, death sting has been removed. And that we can be assured, just as Christ rose from the dead, Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ will raise our mortal bodies to immortality when he comes. Therefore, no wonder Paul says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Oh, there's toil. It's difficult. We know that life is hard, but it is going to an amazing end. And that is the resurrection of our bodies to be with him forever. Grace admits the judgment upon Adam. And let us now finish with this last point. Judgment or grace admits the expulsion from paradise. Grace we see is found in their restored relationship to God and others. Remember Adam's last words of Eve. God had said to Adam, Adam, what are you doing? Did you eat? And he says, the woman made me do it. In a sense, kill her. Remember we talked about that? Kill her. He didn't really think much of his wife at that point. And by the way, Lord, you're the one who gave her to me. 
But now, and I, and I mentioned this last time I said the, his confession was not a confession of a redeemed man. His confession was just trying to get out of trouble. But then we see, I believe, salvation by faith here. And that is in verse 20. He takes up his godly role as leader and he names Eve. Remember that the one who has right, uh, righteous dominion names and he names Eve. But it's interesting what he names her. Well, he, well, he names her Eve, right? Names her Eve because she's the mother of all the living. Adam had been listening to the curse upon Satan and realized that Eve will bear the one, this righteous seed that will crush the serpent. And he trusted in that by faith and then named Eve after that saying life, true righteous life is found in this one. And then that relationship by faith is restored with her. He is upholding her. He's naming her. He's exalting in what she now is. That's a beautiful thing. And then he's restored back to God. So you see grace presented in this expulsion that we'll see now in a minute. And then grace in um, their new coverings. God removes the pathetic coverings of fig leaves and puts garments of skin on them. Now, I want you to just think of this. They would never have thought clothing garments of living creatures. I mean, this would have been a bloody mess to take the skin off that animal and see what, what's he doing? And then he places garments of skins on them to cover their shame. Marcus Dodds says the first man realized that death was a sign of God's anger and that sin could not be covered by a bunch of leaves snatched from a bush, but only by pain and blood. That's true. We know that sin creates pain and blood. It creates it to us, creates it to all those around us. And that, that stream of pain and blood ultimately ends in Jesus, who took upon himself our sin and then clothes us, covers our shame with his righteousness. But notice God does it here and God must do it to you. And it must be painful and it must be bloody. It must be one life for another, Christ's life for your life. He has opened the way and we have to accept that way. But then we see grace in their expulsion because it says in verse 22, now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he's saying that, that I'm going to remove him because if he takes of the tree of life, he'll be in this perpetual state living forever in sin. So it says in verse 24, he drove out the man. And, uh, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that's, that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I mean, we see that he removes him from paradise. Cherubim and a flaming sword are placed over that. And that very same scene is embroidered over the large veil that protected the holy of holies from the holy place, protected um, where God was from God's people. And you could only enter that veil via blood of an animal. And that, that on that veil was the cherubim and a sword. And that when Christ died on that cross, he said to the, to, the, um, to the one next to him, that thief, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you'll be in the holy of holies. But how are we going to get there? How are we going to break through the veil? Well, Christ at that very time was the high priest who was taking his own blood figuratively into that holy place to pay for the sins of that man and, and your sins if you are in Christ. And when he died, that veil was cut from top to bottom, opening up paradise again, throwing open the doors for us to walk in. Grace abounding to sinners, beloved. Grace shown in the curses and in the judgments Christ is presented. Oh, we must realize that entrance back to paradise is not on our terms. We can't do it. It must be on the terms that God sets forward. He has paid the penalty. 
And we are called to repent and believe by faith that we would enter paradise again. Take off those fig leaves of your own good works and receive the righteous garments of Jesus Christ. Yield to him. Are you also, are you killing sin or is sin killing you? Are you trusting in Christ? Are you yielding to him? We are in a divine warfare. We must yield. At that point in time, Adam and Eve thought these denials were the worst thing in the world. How dare God stop me from eating that tree? God puts denials on all of us, but they are never against us. They are always for our good. And Adam and Eve would have learned that that day. And God has put denials on you and you are called to accept those. And through you accepting those, that is a test of your faith, not to stop you from receiving the blessing, but to open the doors of blessing as you trust in the one who can give you all things. And just remember, life is hard. Life is difficult. We are feeling the experiences of the curses but God is sovereign. He was sovereign then and he is sovereign over your life. These things have not taken him by surprise. May God enable you to live ultimately for him, him, having his peace, having spiritual victory. Let us pray. Oh Lord, Father, like Adam and Eve, we have run from you. We have hidden from you. Lord, we have denied you. We've taken of those things that we should not have taken Oh, Lord, and we are living in a world of pain. But, Lord, we see here that even in the judgments, there is grace. Oh, Lord, thank you that Christ, as the second Adam, came to do what the first Adam could not do. He lived that life of righteousness that is our life. He died the death which is our death. He is risen again, which will assure that we will rise again. Lord, bind us, cleanse us, forgive us. Make us afresh, change us. Oh Lord, thank you that we have the assurance of our salvation, the assurance that you will come again. In Jesus' name, amen.